In chapter six, we get something pretty extraordinary for this book. We get Newland Archer one-on-one, -on -one, or one-on-one -on -one with us, the reader. He has been throughout this uh, throughout this novel so far a in a series of public uh, venues where he is with a either in a very uh, very crowded uh, place like the opera or the party, uh, or or even in just like a small gathering or even just with Sillerton Jackson, one on one. But as six commences, as chapter six commences, we get Sillerton Jackson has left and. Newland Archer retires to his own rooms, and we get another uh, bit of the, the the masculine coding for this kind of uh, 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 inner realm of his security, where he should feel very, very comfortable. That evening, after Mr. Jackson had taken himself away and the ladies had retired to their chintz-colored bedroom, Newland Archer mounted thoughtfully to his own study. A vigilant hand had, as usual, kept the fire alive and the lamp trimmed, and the room, with its rows and rows of books, its bronze and steel statuettes of the fencers on the mantelpiece, and its many photographs of famous pictures, looked singularly homelike and welcoming. A lot going on there. Uh, for one, well, the, the ladies are in their chintz-colored uh, room, uh, very feminine, uh, and his is a much more masculine, more masculine coding about the conflict between the masculine and the feminine, always there uh, uh, with, with Wharton, uh, and particularly in this book. And uh, you get the sense that how comfortable it is for him there. Somebody's always there to keep the fire burning so that it's warm, uh, keep the light going so that it, there's light, um, and there are rows and rows of books. Again, that reference to reading, that reference to uh, to uh, to literature as the life of the mind, a particularly masculine uh, pursuit. Um, uh, and also many photographs of famous pictures. In uh, before you could have uh, a lot of really uh, fancy prints, let's say, um, you could get photographs of them. You can't have a uh, an original Monet if you're living in New York, uh, probably, but uh, you can get one from far away. Well, actually, this is probably before Monet was really anything special but you know maybe one of the old masters he would newland archer is really not a monet guy anyway um but something very very um uh is significant a photograph of a work of art again that sense of presentation that sense of artifice uh reproduction is going to be so important here the idea that it's not the real thing but it's a picture of the real thing but it's not even that because it's a picture of a picture of a real thing very frequently uh so there there there's a lot going on in all of this very um uh, this very comfortable and ensconced reality that he has withdrawn to where he can be alone with his thoughts uh, Wharton offers this as uh, the first real sustained look at her character through his own thoughts, and they become significant. As he dropped into his armchair near the fire, his eyes rested on a large photograph of May Welland, which the young girl had given him in the first days of their romance, and which had now displaced all the other portraits on the table. With a new sense of awe, he looked at the frank forehead, the serious eyes, and gay, innocent mouth of the young creature whose soul's custodian he was to be. That terrifying product of social of a, the social system he belonged to and believed in, the young girl who knew nothing and expected everything, looked back at him like a stranger through May Wellen's familiar features. And once more, it was borne in on him that marriage was not the safe anchorage he had been taught to think, but a voyage on uncharted seas. He is disturbed. He's sitting there still irritated, agitated by the, uh, the, the conversation he had had with Sillerton Jackson about, uh, about uh, Olenska and uh, the question of women and the freedom accorded to women. And he is agitated so much so that when he looks at a photograph 
of May Welland, he feels a kind of uh, horror, a kind of dawning uh, sense of doom that, oh my God, yeah, uh, what is this really that I'm getting myself into? Uh, am, is this really what I bargained for? I don't think so. What is the reality of marriage? What is the reality of love? Is there anything like this, uh, this perfect marriage that we all hear about, the happily ever after? What is that? Again, the photograph. <laughs> he is considering appearances. He is considering surface reproductions uh, of something that he is suddenly looking through and saying, well, okay, there's something else there in the quiet of his own study, in the quiet of his most uh, private thoughts. He is turning over the coals of his, uh, uh, of, of his own uh, expectations of life and they're coming up a little bit more disturbing than he's maybe ready for um the uh the the moment of unease is quickly followed then by more thoughts of uh Olenska. the case of the countess Olenska had stirred up old settled convictions and set them drifting dangerously through his mind his own exclamation women should be free as free as we are struck to the root of the problem that it was agreed in this in his world to regard as non-existent nice women however wrong could never claim to be the kind to the kind of freedom he meant and generous minded men like himself were therefore in the heat of argument the more chivalrously ready to concede it to them such verbal generosities were in fact only a humbu a humbugging disguise of the inexorable convictions that tied things together and bound people down to the old pattern so he's admitting that yeah i can say something kind of revolutionary but uh, it's really uh, no cost to me because it's never going to change. Women are not going to change. Women in my life particularly are never going to change. The circumstances are set and inflexible. So he can say whatever he wants in a kind of consequence free environment. Uh, there's, you know, he can say that and it sounds revolutionary. But he was saying it to another guy who's never going to repeat it. And this level of honesty reminds readers that Archer is outside of social scrutiny. But the presence of the readers also suggests that even there he's not. He is alone in his study. He is in a most private venue. He is technically alone, but here we are watching him, following his thoughts. Not quite an interior monologue, but a, uh, a considerably close uh, third person, free and direct uh, 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 narrative where we're given privy to a lot of his thoughts and told about them. Is he ever really alone then? Is he ever really allowed privacy? What kind of freedom does he have beyond hers? He is very unsettled for this environment where he feels so comfortable, where he feels so settled, so protected, so coddled by life. He is unsettled and it is all dwelling around this curious figure of Madame Olenska. Um, he starts to think about his own impending marriage. He starts to think about his devotion to something that he knows he is supposed to regard with some great awe as a convention of society, but he knows that in practice uh, most of the married people he know are not all that inspiring. 
He reviewed his friends' marriages, the supposedly happy ones, and saw none that answered even remotely to the passionate and tender comradeship which he pictured as his permanent relationship, relation with May Wellett. He perceived that such a picture presupposed on her part the experience, the versatility, the freedom of judgment which she had been carefully trained not to possess. And with a shiver of foreboding, he saw his marriage becoming what most of the other marriages about him were, a dull association of material and social interests held together by ignorance on the one side and hypocrisy on the other. Archer examines marriage. He's ruminating on these conventions of society. He's thinking about him in a, in a social and realist mode. What, what is it really? And what examples can I see in the people that I know? Well, it's an ideal, but the examples I see, the married people I know, uh, they're not necessarily ideals. Uh, most of the men he knows that, who are married uh, have uh, affairs. Sometimes uh, another establishment, as they are called, a whole second home, perhaps a second family there. Uh, it, it is known, it is not spoken of necessarily in public, but it is just forgiven. Well, he has his dallases, you know. It's just the way things are. Now, behind this, you can see um, Edith Wharton bringing these things up. These are a female concern, necessarily, because she has lived in that world. She has been married in that world. She has seen the hypocrisy of it, and she is bringing it in from a particularly uh, female perspective, but she's doing so right now through Newland Archer through the male perspective. Now, on the one hand, this allows her to do it without sounding like, oh, there she goes again, just another girl. Uh, this gives it a certain masculine frame. But also it deepens the character because at this moment he is sitting there. He is questioning all of the conventions of society, all of the beliefs of his world. And he's wondering what is going on. What is it really? Why are we all living like this? He has always had absolute faith, you get the sense, in society, in the way things are, the way things should be done. He is happy to live in his little box. But in these moments, in these quiet moments with himself, he is turning over these ideas and starting to wonder, is that the best way? Is that the way things should be? And he's feeling a little untethered, all because of the uh, sudden influence of Olenska. The, um, the consideration of immateriality uh, is, is, is also significant in that he is questioning all these real things, all these social relationships, all of these relatively concrete um, examples of the physical universe, uh, if you will, society, uh, the, the very stuff of the realist tradition. And he is looking at it and trying to get underneath it and trying to probe some of the uh, immaterial pre presuppositions within them. And that is almost pushing towards a kind of modernist uh, perspective. Uh, he says at one point, um, in reality, they all live in a kind of hier hieroglyphic world where the real thing was never said or done or even thought, but only represented by a set of arbitrary signs. Well, you know, this is... Uh, 
<laughs> this is uh, this is modernism, quite frankly. This is postmodernism, honestly. This is semiotics, um, arbitrary signs. But the, uh, the the notion of reality itself is something to be read. Reality is something to be decoded. Uh, and reality as we see it is not in fact anything real. This is again a reproduction of a reproduction, like a photograph of another work of art. A hieroglyphic is something that represents something else. So as you puzzle over the hieroglyphic, as you try and make sense of it, you always need to be conscious that it's not a thing in itself, it's only representing a thing. And that is even more alienating to you. This is abstraction. This is a rejection of the realist understanding of the world. This is also curiously a kind of meta literary term. Hieroglyphics are read. Uh, Wharton is interweaving this moment of, uh, of, of, of deep consideration on the nature of life with considerations of the nature of reading, of aesthetics, of literature. So all these things are coming in because we are in the process of watching this person think. And yes, he is alone, but he is not alone because we are there reading his thoughts the entire time. We are looking into the reality on the page that we see and we are making our own conclusions, drawing our own interpretations about it, just as he is struggling to do because he kind of like he complains about me well and has been told not to or has been trained not to question certain things he's complaining about it with may well and saying that well yeah she's just gonna end up being kind of like a fairly dull person to hang around because she's been made that way but he himself is that way and he's struggling not to be he's struggling to understand how to read the world around him how to understand something beyond just the conventional. He's struggling to deal with the fact that the world that he knows, the world that he is so certain of in this very comfortable position in his life is all a kind of artifice, a kind of representation that is not an actual thing. The, uh, the, the, this is under, well, this is under, uh, written even more, I would say, by the, by another reference to reading. Reading comes in a little bit more. He mentions reading some of the, uh, the naturalists, um, and, and talking about the, the works of essentially Darwin of the, uh, of the age. And this is supposed to be in the, uh, what is it, the 1870s. So, uh, the readings of Darwin were suddenly very, uh, very significant. And again, a very realist, uh, perspective, very determined social, uh, environmental, uh, perspective on, on mankind and, and society in general. But here, uh, he is, uh, he's engaging with more reading also in, in what May has been reading. May has been allowed to read and he nods approvingly that, well, you know, she's reaching some of the proper conclusions about Tennyson, a uh, great Victorian poet of the, uh, uh, of the British tradition. Uh, and um, he, he is regretting that her reading has been so limited. She hasn't been allowed to think outside the lines, so to speak. She has been fed just just the right morsels of, well, what is appropriate to her, and oh, we don't want anything too, too risque or salty, just what would a good girl read? And she can read that and no more. Um, and he felt himself oppressed by this creation of factitious purity, so cunningly manufactured by a conspiracy of mothers and aunts and grandmothers and long dead ancestresses because it was supposed to be what he wanted, what he had a right to, in order that he might exercise his lordly pleasure in smashing it like an image made of snow. There you can see Wharton's uh, uh, heavy hand in this moment, I would say, coming down. She's using this moment that is so 
odd and bizarre, quite frankly, uh, it, to really drive home her point. She's set up this dynamic. She has fleshed out this world in the first five chapters, and now she's really making a specific point. Um, and the fict factitious purity <laughs> is, is a bit arch, but it's very funny. Uh, and because she has always been, uh, uh, she's always been a reader, but when you read, you know, biographies of her and she was very restricted in what she was allowed to read. She was not allowed to read novels when she was growing up. Novels were impure. Um, and you know, how did she get to be such a famous novelist? Well, it took a lot of work when she had a lot of catching up to do by the time she became an adult and could choose what she wanted to read. Uh, and and she, you can feel really the bite underneath that that uh, the the blame of mothers and aunts and grandmothers and long dead ancestresses, the, uh, the obviously all women. And here, if it was a uh, if it was a male author, you might say, well, that's just a misogynist blaming that. But you know, now you. She's coming at it from a woman's perspective. What does that do to that question? Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot going on there. Clearly, she is venting some frustration. Uh, but she is... Uh, she is using this moment to push a specific social critique bound it up in the drama of this character and also use it to weave in uh, some very abstract philosophical uh, and literary ruminations. The whole nature of the project of living and reading uh, are intertwined and coming under very a specific scrutiny at this moment. She is really trying to peel back all the layers of the onion and remind everybody else that she is doing so within a book, within a, con a written construction of artifice, just like everything else. But that process is going on. She might not necessarily know what she's doing as, even, as well. Archer might not necessarily know what she's doing, and she is trying to go through it a little bit more expertly than he is, quite frankly. But the process is one that we all share. The process is one of just wondering what the hell is going on in this world and what is my place in it. Universal questions that, uh, th that should be uh, addressed before you make uh, momentous life choices like getting married, as Newland Archer is about to. Um, so all of this together is more uh, within, while keeping one foot on that realist tradition of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of literary artistry, she is pushing back towards into uh, modernism. She is challenging the limitations of the realist tradition and becoming uh, a kind of modernist in uh, in her own right. Um, but what happens towards the end of that is kind of instructive because uh, you can see Newland Archer is venturing into some very uh, uh, unsettling ideas. Uh, he is essentially questioning the, uh, the validity of his entire social system, of his entire civilization. And this is going to get personal for him. And at a certain point, uh, they, they say, what is it? Uh, it, essentially impatience and irritation overwhelm him. Uh, and, and, and he becomes rather dismissive of it. He's like, oh, that's, I'm just being silly. He says, you know, hang Ellen Olenska. Oh, you know. Um, the narrative. Perhaps Wharton, I don't know. But the narrative reaches a point where it is telling you that he's suddenly shaking himself and saying, oh, I'm just being silly. 
and it lets everything calm down. It puts everything in a kind of perspective, puts it away, gets it away from the primary perspective. And the reader can feel comfort in that. The reader can say, well, yeah, okay. He was just getting a little deep and all right. It was getting a little boring even. And, uh, you know, don't go questioning everything. Just go with it. Come on, right? relax. That tendency to do that, to push away all the disturbing questions is um, very common. Uh, and at this stage in this novel, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of essential because if he came to any great epiphany at this moment, it would be, uh, it would be a relatively short story and not a, not a novel. And she has other plans in mind. But you can see how those sorts of inclinations, those sorts of questions, uh, push into something that then comes back. So, no, 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 we're not going to go there. We're not going to do that. From a uh, from a from a publishing point of view, from an editor's point of view, uh, you can see him saying, "Well, now, okay, you've been going on with this, uh, uh, Edith, for for a couple of pages now, and okay, he's 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 all churned up, he's all disturbed, uh, but you know, put that aside. Let's let's get back to the action, because this is just one man sitting alone in a dark room, thinking. Um, there's only so much of that." anybody can take and especially if it's thinking that is challenging especially if it's thinking that is um affronting settled norms of society you can only do so much so she reels it back in she brings it back. no 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 no. that's all silly brings it back and the the scene then changes in the middle of a chapter she could have ended the chapter right there she could have broken it off right there and said okay that's nice clean discreet right there but no there's a change of scene after that um they you know on the page they skip a little line and they and suddenly a few days later the bolt fell presumably a lightning bolt uh you know bah! after these long sentences that just go on about the interior of his thoughts really taking you giving you a sense that it's all happening in real time as he's thinking it one thing after the other leading to the other and these long sentences that, that go on and on just like thought and they're all oh, it's just it's never ending then suddenly a short choppy sentence right at the beginning of a new section within the same chapter a few days later the bolt fell The plot resurfaces in its prominence. We're told uh, very soon that the, uh, the, that, what was it? It was thus possible for the uh, recipients of Mrs. Lavelle Mingott's invitations to make cruelly clear that their determination not to meet the Countess Olenska. The Mingotts had been planning a big dinner party uh, for everybody, the young set, uh, the fashionable exclusive set, of Newlands and May's uh, uh, friends to come over and meet uh, May's cousin, and they have all stood her up. Um, we're back in the plot. We're back in the comforting, smooth running plots. Like, oh, well, in this one, he did this thing and that thing, and then this happened, and then that happened, and this led to that. This is comforting. This is leaving aside all of those disturbing little thoughts, all of those interior monologue type narration moments where you're not sure where they're leading and they can lead to very disturbing things and they're all bound up inside someone and I don't want to be inside their thoughts. I want to be back out in the social world, the social world where people do things. The second half of chapter six is that it is all plot it is uh it is the rejection of the dinner party it is archer's mother having uh like a long uh speech about how things really are in the social world and how only a few people really matter and she lays out the whole taxonomy of uh of new york society with the very few people who really matter 
right at the top. And then you get down and down into like the other people and they're not as important. And then down to, you know, and this is all still within the, the gradations of the 1% of the 0.1%. Um, as a whole, though, you have to look at this as part of the earlier, the earlier deeply ruminated, deeply personal existential quandary of Newland Archer is matched against this very social society driven conflict where he is just sort of going along for the ride. He's not really driving any of the action here. His mom takes a fairly prominent view of it. And there are a few times that uh, Wharton even sort of makes fun of this. And in the, the very last note of the chapter is uh, the mom saying, uh, uh, I, w I, I wish you would go with me, Newland, telling him what to do, telling him what society expects of him, telling him what his actions and decisions and perspectives should be is what he's kind of always wanted anyway. He's just going along with it. He's just, I don't want to have to do my own thinking. But between the two halves of chapter six, we get this kind of untethered meaninglessness of Archer's meditation. And then this very rigid, stratified, unchanging immobility in the social scene of the second half. Are, how do those two fit together? Are they always in conflict? Is it just in conflict for Archer? Or are we all subject to it?